Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We left off in our last lesson in the midst of examining the message Paul gave the Jews in a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia, and this account is found in Acts chapter 13. He began his sermon by laying out a brief overview of Israel's history, beginning with Abraham, then on to King David, who was the first in the promised line of kings from which Messiah would come. Paul then jumped to John the Baptist and what he had to say about the coming Messiah, and that he was called to prepare the way for Messiah's coming. This reveals how John was widely accepted as a true prophet in Israel. To reject Jesus as Messiah was then to reject John the Baptizer's testimony about Messiah. Next, Paul told the people how the religious elite in Jerusalem had rejected Jesus. In verse 27, Paul said, The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. We aren't told what scriptures they read in synagogue that morning from Torah and the prophets, but I wonder if any of them were directly about the promised Messiah. It's interesting how Paul declared that the elders' rejection of Jesus was actually one important proof that he was the promised Messiah. He went on to state in verse 28, though they had no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. This is a historical fact concerning the injustice that was leveled against Jesus, whether people believe that he's Messiah or not. Jesus hadn't committed a single crime, much less a crime that justified his execution. The truth is the total opposite. He performed all kinds of miracles, which relieved much pain and suffering from those with sickness, disease, disabilities, and demon possession. The forgiveness he gave relieved a vast number of people from the agony of guilt over their sin. His love was so amazing that it was expressed even for the hungering multitudes that follow him, so he fed them. When he raised people from the dead, it would not only bring comfort to those who are mourning, but it would be a comfort to those who believed in the promise of eternal life. When we look at what those men did to Jesus, it's hard to imagine how they could justify their cruelty while knowing he was innocent of any crime and had done Israel much good. How could they live with themselves after they had Jesus unjustly murdered by the Romans? Yet everything they did to Jesus was prophesied about and only gave further proof of who he was and is. Then in verse 29, Paul said, When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Notice that Paul is once again showing how everything that happened to Jesus was prophesied in the sacred scriptures that proved this was all orchestrated by God. How exact Paul got into all this, we don't know, since this is probably only a synopsis of what he said. After crucifying the Savior, Joseph of Arimathea took him down and buried him in his own tomb. Paul didn't mention that the tomb Jesus was buried in belonged to a prominent member of the Sanhedrin and that no one had ever been buried in it before. In verses 30 and 31, Paul declares the good news, but God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, and they are now his witnesses to our people. Here's the importance of faithful eyewitnesses and how this was and still is a powerful testimony to the Jewish people. To say that Jesus was the Messiah, yet was still dead, offers no hope, nor would it inspire people to follow a dead religious leader. But the fact that he rose from the dead gives proof of his divinity and reveals why he came into our world. There's no greater testimony than that of the Creator God, who is the way, the truth, and the life. If he remained dead in the grave, then his testimony is worthless. But given that he rose again, his testimony is the most important in the entire world, the most important in all of eternity. Paul stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, by the writing of 1 Corinthians, there were around 500 people that were still alive that were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. 
That's a powerful testimony. In this case, Paul is referring to Christ's ascension into heaven. The number of people that saw Jesus on a more intimate level was much smaller. But even if we're talking about two to three dozen people, that's still a powerful number of people to give clear testimony to the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. There's more than enough solid evidence of who Jesus is, what he came to do, what he accomplished, and the fact that he rose again and ascended into heaven. Those who don't want to believe make the choice not to believe the evidence and will accept any lie to support their unbelief. Those who want to know the truth, there's more than enough proof to satisfy an honest, seeking heart. The next thing Paul said is found in verses 32 and 33. We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Paul is using the Old Testament scriptures to help the Jews in this synagogue to see that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Some will accept the message, while most won't. Yet it's right that he builds his argument upon God's word. Otherwise, there's nothing of substance to legitimately support his claim. As with all prophecy, there's a target group that the prophecy is pointing to, and a time when it will come to pass. To say that the Lord promised to send a Savior and then not believe it could happen in their lifetime is unbelief. This is what the majority of Jews did in that day. They refused to believe that the promise could be fulfilled in their lifetime. We have that same kind of problem today with the second coming of Christ. Many people who believe that Jesus is coming soon don't live like it, so they don't really believe what the Word of God teaches on the matter. Jesus is coming soon, and that truth is as real as His first coming. There's a generation that will see all the prophecies about Christ's second coming unfold before their very eyes. We wait for that day by faith, just as it was necessary for the Jews to do for Christ's first coming. Paul was proclaiming the wonderful truth that the prophecy about Messiah had been perfectly fulfilled in Jesus and that they should put their faith in Him as Lord and Savior. Paul is quoting the second psalm, verse 7, that reads, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, today I have become your father. Before we go any further, we need to see that there is a profound mystery surrounding the Trinity, and we will not solve this mystery in this life and probably not even in the next. This is why we must accept the Trinity by faith, since it has been clearly revealed in Scripture. As to our Lord, He has neither beginning or end. He is the uncreated Creator who is outside of time. The very idea of a Son speaks to us humans of beginning and end. Yet the eternal, timeless Son has no beginning and no end. He was not created because He's God. We time-bound creatures have a terrible time understanding this truth. When we look at our Lord's humanity, there is a beginning when He was supernaturally conceived in the womb of Mary. So, in this sense, it could be said that it was at that moment in human history Jesus became the Son. The problem with this is the eternal Sonship of Jesus, and so we face the mystery here as well. If this verse is in reference to the resurrection, as some suggest, then it speaks of the indestructible life of Christ that would never see corruption. There's a lot of debate in theological circles about what it means that Jesus is the Son of God, and it won't do us any good to go through them all. Here is the simple facts. Jesus is God. He is the eternal, timeless God who has no beginning and no end. He took upon Himself our humanity so that He could be our sin offering. We know that the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son and that Holy Spirit is neither the Father or the Son, yet there is only one God. All this is a mystery that we will never fully understand, and we need not be afraid to embrace the mystery that surrounds the infinite transcendent God. At the same time, we should strive to understand who He is to the best of our ability, and to enjoy the mysteries of God that we know exist. We will always come to the place in seeking to comprehend the Trinity and nature of Christ where our finite minds can go no further, where we must by faith lay hold of the truth that's been revealed to us. The serious nature of the Trinity is that if people reject this truth about God, they forfeit their soul because they have created a God who doesn't exist, and this is called idolatry. 
The fact that the Trinity is an infinite mystery that only God understands doesn't tarnish the truth or diminish it in the least. This should actually make a stand in awe of him, for he is beyond human comprehension. Any God that we can figure out, we have just proved that he's not God. God in his very nature is incomprehensible. Whoever told us that we could figure out the infinite mysteries of God? It certainly wasn't God himself. More than likely, it was a devil who wants us to believe lies and question the existence of God. The mysteries of God will only be embraced by those who want to know the truth and who love the divine mysteries we call God. Those who don't want to know the truth will reject the wonder of the divine mysteries to the ruin of their own souls. Paul quotes a few more prophecies about Jesus to prove that his teachings were biblically sound, and we see this in verses 34 and 35. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Paul was declaring a fact, not fiction or personal opinion. If a man is found dead and there's no murder weapon or suspect, the detectives have nothing but hypothesis and opinions. The only facts they have is that there's a body, how the man died, and roughly when he died. Now, if there were eyewitnesses of this murder, their case would change as solid evidence would begin to accumulate. For Paul to refer to Christ's resurrection as a fact is more than reasonable. It's a fact that Jesus was crucified. It's a fact that he died and was buried in an empty tomb. It's a fact that there were over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. This is all overwhelming evidence. The fact that the father raised the son before decay had a chance to perform its natural work is proved in that Jesus rose again before decay could happen. Paul quoted Isaiah 55 verse 3 from the Septuagint. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. The apostle clearly equates this as a prophecy concerning Christ's resurrection from the dead. The sure mercies or sure blessings are given to those who receive by faith Christ's atonement on the cross. Because Jesus rose from the grave, his work of atonement made the way for us to go to heaven. If Christ's resurrection wasn't a fact, then not one of the promises of the new covenant would be true. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then as Paul said elsewhere, our faith in preaching would be utterly worthless. In verse 35, Paul quoted Psalms 16.10, You will not let your Holy One see decay. He quotes to support the prior point concerning the covenant the Lord made with King David, that his throne would be eternal, that it would be fulfilled because Messiah would sit upon that throne. For that promise to be fulfilled, Messiah would have to be a descendant of David, according to his humanity, and must be truly human. This means that Messiah would be 100% God and 100% human. Here's a mystery that will keep us busy trying to understand throughout eternity. To give further proof to support his arguments, Paul declared in verses 36 and 37, For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. The idea that David served God's purpose in his generation simply means that after he had accomplished the will of God, he died. Here's another fact. David died, and his body suffered the ravages of decay. So we know the prophecies Paul is quoting doesn't refer to King David, but to one of his descendants. Though Jesus was the son of David as to his human lineage, as God he was before David, and after making atonement for sin, he rose again. Paul is emphasizing the resurrection to demonstrate how important this fact is to prove that Jesus is Messiah. Even if we believe that Jesus is our atonement for sin, but there's no resurrection, then we still can't go to heaven because the way wasn't made. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then his atonement has eternal value, proving that the way to heaven has been opened to us through the blood of Christ and his resurrection. The benefits of the atonement and resurrection come through faith, and without faith in Christ, no one can obtain a resurrection to eternal life. Paul presses this thought home in verses 38 and 39. 
Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. The apostle is being faithful to his calling and presenting to his fellow Jews that there is full forgiveness of sins through Christ alone. This truth must have ruffled the people's feathers. He told them that through Jesus, there can be the forgiveness of sins that gives justification from everything the law of Moses was powerless to forgive and justify. The weakness of the law was being exposed, but most practicing Jews wouldn't be open to such a thought. They might even quote in their own defense Psalms 19.7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And they would be right. The law is perfect in what it was given to do but it was never meant to do what only Jesus could do through his substitutionary death on the cross. Under the law, there was only forgiveness for unintentional or accidental sin. There was no forgiveness for premeditated or intentional sin. That's why there was no atonement for sexual sins and premeditated murder. This is proof that the law was limited in what it could do, but Christ's atonement is limitless because as God, he is limitless. His blood can cleanse any sinner that will repent and turn from their sin to serve the living God. The point that people can be justified is a forensic thought in that Christ's atonement legally satisfied the justice of God that determined the wages of all sin is death. Everyone who puts their faith in Christ is forgiven and absolved of every crime they committed against God, and all sin is ultimately against God, who is the lawgiver. All condemnation is removed from the forgiven, and they are justified because Jesus took the punishment we deserve for the crimes we committed. All this and much more the Mosaic Law was powerless to do for mankind. The law declares what sin is and clearly defines its consequences, but it has no ability to deliver people from sin and its consequences. That can only happen through Christ. The final points of Paul's sermon is found in verses 40 and 41. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Paul is quoting Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. The apostle was warning the Jews he was preaching to so that the judgments that were threatened by God through Habakkuk wouldn't come upon them. The God of the Old Testament that hates sin is the God of the New Testament that hates sin. He cannot change. Many people think that God was hard on sin in the Old Testament and winks at sin in the New because he's now a God of love and grace. God offers grace in the Old Testament just as much as he offers grace in the New. The fact that the Lord is a God of love and grace doesn't mean sin ceases to be exceedingly evil. To practice sin in the name of grace is a dreadful evil, and those who practice such sin will pay for their arrogant and willful rebellion against God. The Lord used Habakkuk to rebuke the Israelites for scoffing at the promise the Lord gave the people. They mocked God and His promises through their persistent practice of sin and self-justification. Not only was their practice of sin an act of mocking God, but their persistent unbelief was as well. Unbelief declares that God is not who he says he is or will do what he said he will do. This is an accusation that God is a liar. Paul declares this point in Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. The anointing of the Holy Spirit that was upon Paul while preaching is seen in the results as outlined in verses 42 and 43. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Paul brilliantly used the Old Testament scriptures and the historical events of Jesus to prove that he is the promised Messiah. But the truth without the anointing of Holy Spirit is powerless. 
For God designed the gospel to be preached through the word and the spirit, not one or the other, but both. When we fail to preach the word of God through the spirit of God, we fail God's calling and purpose in our lives, and we fail the people of God in a perishing world. The Jews were moved by the spirit-anointed preaching, and they invited the two apostles back to speak on the following Sabbath. We see from this that many Jews and Gentiles that converted to Judaism began to follow Jesus. I would imagine that Paul and Barnabas met with the people and taught them in private more fully the truths of who Messiah Jesus is and what it means to follow him. During their time in the city, they taught these new converts how to continue in the true grace of God, and so a church was born in that great pagan city, and the gospel was spreading. We are then told in verse 44 that on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. This is revival, where Holy Spirit draws people in great numbers, and many are saved, healed, and delivered. In the days following Paul's sermon preached in the synagogue, the missionary team must have been spreading the good news to people all over the city. What the population of that city was, I don't know, but enough people attended the synagogue that Sabbath that it definitely caused a great stir, especially since many Gentiles were in attendance. Those who don't want to be inconvenienced by revival will fight against the move of God in one way or another, and this is exactly what happens in this account. The fact that so many people went to the synagogue to hear Paul speak reveals that there was a profound spiritual hunger among the people in that city. Then in verses 45 through 47, we are told, When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. What a tragic response to the move of God, and this has been repeated far too often throughout human history. The Jews didn't fight against Paul and his companions because they were speaking lies, but because they were jealous. Why were they jealous? Because they were proud and self-centered. The pride of man has done untold damage to the human race. It's damned multitudes to hell and done terrible harm to the true church. Many revivals have been shut down because of jealousy and pride. Instead of embracing the Spirit's move, they fight against the Holy Spirit. And in the account we are studying, the people literally fulfilled the word Paul quoted from Habakkuk. He warned them not to be scoffers who refused to believe what the Lord promised. Yet here they were doing exactly what the elders of Jerusalem did in rejecting Messiah. Their wounded pride produced in them jealousy, which in turn caused them to attack Paul and Barnabas, though they had nothing of substance in which to base their attacks upon. A judgment fell upon these Jews, yet most of them never understood this. The Lord left them and began reaching out to the Gentiles who wanted to hear the truth of a Savior that could save them from their sins. This was good news to the Gentiles, but to most of the Jews, it was a message that brought judgment and death upon them. They weren't rejecting Paul and Barnabas, but Jesus, their promised Messiah. This produced a monumental shift in Paul's ministry, even though he knew it was coming. Though the mission team was ministering to Gentiles, their main objective to this point had been to reach the Jews. Now radical change was taking place, and they would seek after those Gentiles who were hungering and thirsting after God. Paul and Barnabas boldly declared that they had to first speak to the Jews because they were the ones to whom the promises were first given. But when they rejected their Messiah, Paul and his fellow missionaries were compelled to seek after those who would embrace the message of salvation. It's interesting how Paul said that the Jews not only rejected the message of salvation, but didn't consider themselves worthy of obtaining eternal life. This is basically stating that they passed judgment on themselves and chose the prison of hell instead of an eternity with God. There are always consequences to our actions. One judgment that came upon the Jews after rejecting the message of salvation was not being part of the great reaping that followed.
Their rebellion caused a dark veil to cover their hearts and blind them to the truth. All because they were too proud to hear the message and grew jealous over people rushing to enter the kingdom of Messiah. Another judgment that came upon them was the growing division between the Jewish and Christian faiths, and this too was the result of the pride and jealousy of the Jews. As the Jews rejected the message of salvation by grace through faith, the Gentiles came flocking into the kingdom. The Lord commanded those two apostles to preach to the Gentiles, and they could quote the word to support everything they did as they were being led by Holy Spirit. The Old Testament was paving the way for the new, and these men of God knew how to use the word to preach the gospel and to prove its validity from the law and the prophets. The Jews who claimed to love the word of God rejected the word that revealed Messiah. Yet Jesus fulfilled over 350 Old Testament prophecies about his first coming. Paul then quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6, on how the church would take the light of Messiah to the Gentiles and how they would receive the Savior. It had always been the Lord's plan to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It just took time to unfold the plan of salvation so that it could be clear enough for people to obey the message. Though this is what the prophets taught, the Jews rejected it nonetheless. The Jews should have been the first messengers to take the gospel around the world. And in one sense they were, but only a small number. Just think what could have happened if the entire nation had embraced Jesus as their Messiah. Look at what a few Jews accomplished in spreading the gospel around the world until the Gentiles came to faith and were then used to spread the good news even further. In verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Like I said earlier, this was authentic revival that sweeps in the lost in great numbers. This revival took place not because the Jews rejected Jesus, but in spite of their rejection. They could have been an integral part of it if they wanted to and helped advance it, but their pride robbed them of salvation and the joy of being used to see multitudes come to Christ. The Gentiles rejoiced that salvation had come to them, and they honored the word of the Lord, which means that they accepted it by faith and obeyed it to the saving of their souls. Now we must look at the phrase, all who were appointed for eternal life, or as the King James Version worded it, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now, as you probably well know, I'm not a Calvinist and never will be. I reject the idea of predestination because I believe that it is thoroughly unbiblical. The verb Paul used that some translate as predestined, which it doesn't mean that, actually means to put in order, to appoint, to dispose, and it has nothing to do with predestination. Taking this in context, the idea is simple and implies the readiness of the mind the Gentiles had to embrace the gospel as opposed to the Jews that were rejecting it. God doesn't force people to go to heaven or to hell against their will. By the Lord's sovereign will, he gave mankind a free will. It has limitations, of course, that are defined by his will. It's important to note that he will not violate the gift he has given mankind or take it from them. Peter declared in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We see here the heart of God and his love for mankind. This is the heart that brought about Calvary and the empty tomb. The doctrine of limited atonement is a lie, for it's not built upon scripture and sound theology, but upon philosophy and man's distorted concept of the sovereignty of God. This is all a divine mystery. God is actively working in his creation in ways that we cannot comprehend. It's our duty as mere mortals created in God's image to stand in awe of him, not to claim to have figured out how an infinite God works in finite creation and in human history. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth.
us no more So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk